So, and I'm responsible to introduce today's speakers. Today's speaker is Ms. Uh, Mrs. Karen Triff. Mrs. Triff is a fellow Aggie and currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Biology, acquired by Dr. Robert Shelton. She has a major in microbiology at the University of Florida and a biological science major with chemistry minor at the Florida International University. Her research dwells on, de on determining the effect of colon cancer progression on histone modifications which regulate gene expression. Additionally, she is studying uh, the in vivo chemoprotective, Syner the synergistic effect of uh, nutritional derivatives such as DHA from fish oil and butyrate from fermentable fiber on in intestinal chromatin modifications. Sorry. She already published two ar articles regarding her st studies in journals such as Current, Current Pharmacology and Physiological Genomics. In addition, she won two years straight the Early Career Research Award of Ge Geographical Management Program for Cancer Health Disparities in 2014 and 15. Today's presentations, I've got a gyro round, I think. It's, it's fine. <laughs> Just say what you have. Uh, please help me out. Welcome, Mrs. Mrs. Currently. Thank you. <clears throat> so more specifically today, I'll be speaking about the epi epigenetic mechanisms by which chemoprotective natural compounds promote lipid metabolism signaling and reduce colon cancer progression. Our overall goal is to delineate the mechanisms by which a fish oil and fermentable fiber diet combination reduce colon cancer risk. The clinical relevance associated with this goal is that pesco vegetarians in particular have a much lower risk of colorectal cancer. And additionally, these bioactive compounds <coughs> synergistically induce apoptosis by targeting multiple cellular signaling pathways in preclinical rodent models, lack the toxicity associated with traditional chemotherapy, and provide a novel opportunity for the prevention of cancer. So when I talk about epigenetics, I am referring to gene expression controlled by factors other than an individual's DNA sequence, such as DNA methylation, histone tail modifications, chromatin remodelers, and functional RNAs. Our specific objective is to determine how epigenetic changes associated with colon cancer progression are modulated by highly chemoprotective fish oil plus fermentable fiber combination. So when I, when I say I focus on colon cancer progression, I focus on the future tumorigenesis stage where the normal crypt has become an aberrant crypt, but prior to polyp and tumorigenesis formation. One of the bioactive compounds I focus on is fish oil. And the major bioactive components in fish oil are, are the long omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA. They suppress colon cancer risk in human and preclinical models, and their epigenetic features include EPA and DHA can act as transcription factor ligands by preferentially binding to nuclear receptors such as PPARs, RARs, RXR, FXR, etc. Another compound I focus on is pectin, a readily fermentable fiber. Short chain fatty acids are a major product of fermentable fiber and specifically butyrate, a histone deacetylase inhibitor, inhibits colon cancer cell growth via alterations in a gene expression. So inside the gut, the intestinal bacteria produce short chain fatty acids from fermentable fiber and these include butyrate, acetate, and propionate. Then these short chain fat fatty acids, specifically butyrate, can enter the colonic epithelial cell and can act as histone deacetylase inhibitors, leading to a more transcriptionally active state by increasing DNA availability for the transcriptional machinery. Alternately, butyrate can become a source of acetyl CoA after beta oxidation inside the mitochondria, and it can either be used for energy, oh, forgive me. It can either be used for energy or it can alternately be um, formed into citrate and shuttled into the nucleus where it can be also become an acetylation substrate. So therefore, uh, butyrate from fermentable fiber can induce epigenetic changes as an HTAC inhibitor or as a histone acetylation substrate. My overall hypothesis is that the combinatorial effects of the fermentable fiber plus fish oil will alter transcription chromatin state and nuclear receptor regulation of gene activity to reduce colon cancer progression.
Some studies have used in vitro models. However, this is the first in vivo study examining the genome-wide epigenetic effects of fish oil plus fermentable fiber during colorectal cancer progression. At week zero, we begin diet supplementarization, supplementar, supplementation, supplementation, forgive me. And two weeks after that, we injected the rats with either AOM or saline. And 10 weeks after that, at the cancer progression stage, we extracted the colon. And the diet supplementation that I gave my animals is either a controlled diet that contains a poorly fermentable fiber cellulose and corn oil, which is rich in N6 PUFAs, a diet that contains the corn oil plus the fermentable fiber pectin, a diet that alternately contains the bioactive fish oil with N3 PUFAs and the poorly fermentable fiber, and a combinatorial diet that includes both the fish oil and the readily fermentable fiber pectin. So these diets contain either 15% corn oil by weight or 3.5% corn oil plus 11.5% fish oil, which equals 30% of calories, and either 6% pectin or 6% cellulose, which is equal to 30 grams of fiber per day for humans. When I extract the colon, I examine the mucosa for abernic crypt foci, and to specifically focus on the epigenetics, I use the epithelial cells from the distal colon to do high throughput sequencing on RNA on the RNA and chromatin state. So first, I find um, that fish oil plus pectin synergistically suppress malignant transformation of the colon. And compared to our controlled diet, we find the most re remarkable decrease in HMACF incidence comes from the diet containing both fish oil and pectin together. So please note that for the rest of my talk, it is likely I will refer to these different diets as either CC, CP, FC, and FP, just to save some time. So then I can ask the question, what global epigenetic effects of fish oil and pectin are associated with the suppression of colon tumor genesis? First, I look at the RNA level to globally fingerprint transcripts to assess the response of carcinogenesis. This requires taking the total mRNA, sequencing it, aligning it, annotating it, and calculating differential expression. So to calculate the total number of differentially expressed genes, I compared each of my bioactive containing diets versus our cellulose control diet. Specifically, I focus on histone tail modifications, which are regulators of gene expression. So the nucleosome is the first stage of packaging in the DNA into chromatin. It contains eight histone proteins and a combination of these histone post-translational modifications in the histone tail may create binding epitopes that recruit other proteins associated with the transcriptional machinery. So this can sort of have multiple effects. For example, modifications such as acetylation lower the charge of the global histone of the globular histone core, and these are predicted to loosen core DNA associations or the histone tails can also affect histone DNA and histone, histone interactions within the nucleosome core. And the information stored this way is considered <clears throat> epigenetic since it is not encoded in the DNA itself. So I performed ChIP-seq in order to globally assess histone tail modifications in response to carcinogenesis. For this, the epithelial cells of the distal colon are extracted then fragment the chromatin and add antibodies specific to my histone tail modification of interest. Then I isolate only the DNA wrapped around the histones with our tail modifications of interest. Then you go through the same process of sequencing, annotation, and differential expression calculation. And the epigenetic histone modifications I specifically focused on were histone 3 lysine 4 trimethylation or histone 3 lysine 9 acetylation both of which are usually act, uh, present at the transcription start site of active transcription, but missing in silence genes. This is a summary of all the detected genes at the K4ME3, K9AC, and RNA level. 
and I found over a thousand genes that were enriched with K4ME3, almost 12,000 genes that were enriched with K9AC, over 10,000 genes that were actively transcribed, meaning that the gene was actually generating RNA. And of these, over 10,000 contain both histone modifications simultaneously. And of the ones that contain both histone modifications simultaneously, over 9,000 of them were also being actively transcribed. And this is a summary of genes with differential expression and differential enrichment output. So there were two cutoff parameters I employed, a statistical cutoff of the false discovery rate under 0.1 and a less stringent p-value cutoff of under 0.01. So to determine the global overall facial effect, I compared all facial containing diets versus all coronal containing diets. And to give you a better idea of what I say when I mean DERs in differentially enriched regions, you can see here that there are locations that can be visualized as peaks along the genome and specifically along the gene body, in this case, FATP1, a fatty acid binding protein. And here you'll find K4ME3 fish oil versus corn oil and K9AC fish oil versus corn oil again. And basically when I call, talk about DERs, it's gonna be referring to these regions that were either upregulated or downregulated in one of our bioactive samples. To determine the pectin overall effects, I performed a similar type of analysis, comparing all pectin containing diets versus all cellulose containing diets. And here it gives you just a better idea of official k 9 k 4 me 3 and RNA levels using these different statistical cutoffs. Then I wanted to know by comparing the total number of differentially expressed and differentially enriched genes at each treatment at different epigenetic stages, RNA, K4ME3, and K9AC, I observed very poor correlation between the multiple epigenetic levels. So the intersect containing of the genes containing all of these modifications, or at least two of these modifications at the same time was pretty low when you have the FDR cutoff of under 0.1. And we have the same effect, we see the same pattern when we relax our cutoff to p-value of under 0.01. Therefore, poor correlation is observed between the DE transcripts and histone tail modifications with DERs. We'll, you'll hear me say, and you'll see up here, DE and DERs a lot. So DE stands for differentially expressed, so think RNA. And then DERs is the differentially enriched regions that you'll see in histone tail modifications. A similar poor correlation was observed across the multiple epigenetic levels in the pectin overall effect. You can see here these tests done with the FDR cutoff of under 0.1 and the same when you have an FDR and p-value cutoff of 0.01. So again, we see this poor correlation at multiple epigenetic levels using or calculating for both uh, bioactive compounds. My working epigenetic hypothesis when I first started out this experiment were that the combinatorial effects of pectin, specifically its products, uh, short chain fatty acids, plus fish oil will uniquely activate the ligand dependent nuclear receptor pathways. Under the premise that in, in colon cancer progression, chemoprotective genes are silenced, pectin, in this case specifically butyrate, would act as a histone tail acetylator. However, we would need the fish oil for the N3 PUFAs to act as activators of nuclear receptors that are com commonly inhibited in colorectal cancer. And this would produce this synergistic chemoprotective effect where you would have induction of nuclear receptors associated with chemoprotective genes. In order to determine what each bioactive compound was doing in a context specific manner, we performed pairwise analysis of each diet treatment versus the control corn oil plus cellulose diet under carcinogenic and saline conditions. So this is a summary of the differentially expressed genes, in this case, including all the bioactive diets versus the controlled diets under either AOM or saline. And again, it's separated by histone acetylation, FDR, p-value. 
okay, for ME3 and RNA. We further intersected the differentially transcribed genes <laughs> from the fish oil plus pectin combination diet with the diets containing each bioactive compound individually and against the diets uh, containing each bioactive compound separately. And again, you just see that the majority of the time you don't have much intersection between each diet separately versus the diet combined. Same thing happens when you relax their statistical cutoff to p-value on their 0.01. Again, poor correlation. If we look at not just the transcriptional level, but the other epigenetic levels, K4ME3 and K9AC, this time, just going to mention the p-value cutoff of under 0.01. You again see a similar pattern where the majority of the genes are not simultaneously deregulated, dysregulated. So again, poor correlation is observed between the combination fish oil plus pectin diet and fish oil and pectin individually. I also sought to compare how similar the effects of the same dietary treatment would be under saline versus carcinogenic conditions. So we see here at different epigenetic levels with different bioactive compounds in the diet, the ones unique to saline, the differentially expressed or well, differentially enriched regions unique to AOM, and the ones in common. And the same thing for saline specific, AOM specific, and found in both for the transcription and K9AC. So at every epigenetic level and each type of diet, most of the dysregulated genes were different in the saline versus A1. So high throughput data per se does not really produce many biological findings. Genes do not work alone, but in an intricate network of interactions. So pathway analysis helps interpret the data in the context of biological processes, pathways, and networks. I used all the data sets with differentially expressed and enriched genes for pathway analysis. The cutoffs that I used during pathway analysis were considering direct relationships only, colon-specific effects only, and experimentally confirmed interactions between genes, proteins, and chemical compounds only. The outcomes that I received included biological functions and processes, target genes and biomarkers, signaling and metabolic pathway relationships, and transcription factor activity. So by performing this functional analysis to expose plausible biological processes that may explain the gene expression changes in our data sets, I found 24% of the FPA versus CCA differentially transcribed genes were related to lipid metabolism. That's total of 68 genes. Therefore, lipid metabolism biological functions were the most affected by fish oil plus pectin diet under carcinogenic conditions. So as I mentioned before, every time you hear me see FPA, CCA, and CPA, in the context of differential expression, it means that they were compared to the coronal cellulose control diet under either AOM or saline conditions. If we wanna see and interpret a more, perform a more detailed analysis of those differentially expressed genes associated with lipid metabolism, this kind of diagrams helps me determine what kind of effects fish oil plus pectin was inducing in colonic epithelial cells during colon cancer progression. So these lines tell you what genes and its differential expressions that they're associated with. For example, increased beta oxidation or decreased concentration of lipid would be associated with the genes it's pointing at. Now, because it was 68 genes, this looks like a pretty messy picture. So we're gonna have to break it down a little bit more. Many genes you see here serve multiple purposes, 
So their upregulation is simultaneously associated with fatty acid metabolism and concentration of lipid. And the same here, many of these genes are simultaneously associated with transport of lipid and also beta oxidation of fatty acid and beta oxidation of long chain fatty acids. Some of these genes were also associated with the excretion of bile acids and the concentration of bile acid being reduced. So I should have said this at the beginning, biological functions that are activated are in red, biological functions that are inhibited are in blue. And every time I'm talking about gene expression or changes in differentially enriched regions, they're gonna be blue for downregulated and orange for upregulated. If you look at these genes that are highlighted in blue, these are specifically associated with the mitochondrial L-carnitine pathway, with shuttling pathway, which basically means these are the genes that shuttle fatty acids into the mitochondria. As you can see, they're all upregulated. So if we also wanna see how many of these genes were found in the data containing only fish oil under AOM conditions, these uh, yellow highlighted genes were found instead of in the combination diet, if you were to only look at the fish oil containing diet versus the control. Say you wanted to also see what pectin by itself was doing, and then we'll find that with a star, and only one gene was differentially expressed under pectin only conditions. Then I ask also, well, what about my combinatorial diet on the saline conditions? And then you see these are the genes that are associated, that are also present in my diagram and in my saline background diet. So you can see only, there's a couple of big hitters that come up multiple times. You'll see them come up again and again. And these are not the only ones, but AQP, aquaporin 8, cytochrome 450, ACSVG, which I will talk about a little bit more, is an acyl COA synthesase, which activates fatty acids to their COA derivatives and plays a central role in fatty acid metabolism. Basically, all the genes in here, especially the ones that are highlighted multiple times, are key to fatty acid metabolism, specifically fatty acid catabolism and a decrease in concentration of lipids. And the lipids that these genes in general decrease include cholesterol and triglycerols, sorry, acylglycerols. The cultural network, cultural networks constructed from individual relationships curated from the literature are very useful to create mechanistic hypotheses that explain, that explain the expression changes that we observe in our data. So we use a statistical approach to determine and score these upstream regulators uh, whose connections to our data set genes are unlikely to occur by random models. So basically that means that we take genes that have been previously associated with a specific upstream regulator and compare them to the genes within these genes that are also present in our data sets and calculate the, calculate the statistical significance of these being there by random. And we also take a similar approach for determining activity. This means that for, this, for these upstream regulators, we also consider the, the directionality of these genes, whether they were upregulated or downregulated. And from that, we can try to extrapolate whether these upstream regulators are activating or inhibitory in general. Most of these pathway analysis, what I'm trying to emphasize is that prior biological knowledge greatly facilitates the meaningful interpretation of gene expression observed in data sets because with data sets so big, you, know, you don't only need your own knowledge, but an overall global knowledge of what's going on. The chemoprotective effects of plectin, pectin plus fish oil during colon cancer progression include the activated transcription of nuclear receptors classically associated with N3-PUFAs. So maybe a little bit hard to see here, but these are some of the nuclear receptors that were statistically found to be activated. They include PXR, FXR, 
glutocorticoid receptor and LXR. So you can see the majority of these genes are upregulated. That's how we know that these are not only statistically significant, but activated. For my upstream regulators, you'll see activated as yellow, inhibited as green, and again, the gene expression with the same colors as before. Now we look at the PPAR specifically, and we find a similar pattern of activation. And all these findings are in agreement with previous research on other organ systems indicating that N3-PUFA and its metabolites are more present than the N6-PUFA as an in vivo activator of PPARs. A lot of these experiments have been done in either the intestine or kidney or other organs, but many of these genes and many of these activations this is the first time we see them in the colon. And although I, you can't quite see it with these pictures because I don't break it down, the majority, many of these genes also come up when you have the fish oil only diet like before, <laughs> but you only see this huge enrichment when the fish oil plus pectin diet are combined. So if we consider all the genes we previously found to be associated with beta oxidation and a decrease of concentration of lipid and transport of lipid, et cetera. And we extract all the genes from those previous lists that were associated with upstream regulators. What we find is that a lot of the genes disappear. So a lot of the upstream regulators that were activated are actually responsible for, or seem to be responsible for the upregulation of all these genes that are associated with lipid metabolism, which is not really surprising. So as you can see, all the beta oxidation genes of fatty acid disappear, and many of the fatty acid genes associated with the binding of acopensatoic acid and DHA and concentration of bile acid and excretion of bile acid disappear. But we still have some that are associated with fatty acid metabolism and with concentration of lipid. Although our ability to statistically say that they're either significantly inhibited or activated sort of goes away. In conclusion, what I see is a poor correlation exists between differentially transcribed and enriched genes at one, multiple epigenetic levels, two, fat fiber dietary combinations, and three, in the presence or absence of carcinogen. And I also know that a combinatorial diet official plus pectin during cancer progression is synergistically chemoprotective, uniquely affects epigenetic profiles in the intestinal epithelium, upregulates lipid catabolism and beta oxidation associated genes, and also upregulates genes transcribed by ligand dependent nuclear receptors associated with N3 PUFAs. So it seems that these PUFAs accept their beneficial effects by upregulating the expression of genes, encoding for proteins involved in fatty acid oxidation. And this is enhanced when you have the short chain fatty acids, most likely butyrate added to the diet. Our genes also predict, uh, are also predict uh, an inhibition of concentration of lipids and cholesterol. Our data also contribute to the understanding of the regulatory action of chemoprotective bioactive compounds found in fish oils and readily fermentable fiber in colonic crypts, and therefore provide a mechanistic insight into these previous clinical and epidemiological findings. And that's it. Apparently my talk was way shorter than I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> Um, so thank you to my lab, of course, for all their help and for my funding partners, especially the National Institutes of Health. And I will take any questions. Any questions from, from the audience? Because there's no lunch afterwards, so now's the only time to get a shot at Karen. <laughs> Please grill me. <laughs> Here, uh, among all the um, histones and their various modifications, how do you choose, you know, you chose two to study. How do you make that choice? 
it is kind of subjective. And one of the reasons is that they're well studied. So we could apply since this is not an extensively studied field. It's kind of new. I wanted some that had some previous data to rely upon and be able to interpret my own. And by choosing one that was acetylated and another one that was trimethylated, it also helped me to distinguish maybe which ones were actually being associated with butyrate and its acetylation qualities versus activation in general. There, but I don't think those are the only two that should be analyzed. And I did try like six before picking which two seem to look better under my specific conditions, especially because I'm using tissue, which is not common usually use cell lines, which are a lot easier. Um, <coughs> I'm just curious. Uh, you, you show that facial and pectin increase the, uh, the gene expression of the uh, oxidation associated genes and also the leaky transport. What about the lipogenesis? I didn't see those, like you mean to increase the amount of lipids that are being created. Right. So I looked for those to see, well, if you're having more beta oxidation, are you also making more fatty acids? And I didn't see any of the enzymes being upregulated for that specific type of mechanism. And I also checked for seeing whether these things are beta oxidized, they're becoming acyl, are they entering into the TCA cycle and becoming energy? And I didn't see the genes associated with that pathway being enhanced either. And maybe you can just take a second and elaborate on what sort of skill sets do you need to develop uh, in order to tackle this type of global large data set of endeavor? There were a very it was an incremental process because it's a fairly new field. Most people don't try to do differential expression. They mostly see, okay, are these enriched areas with histone tail modifications there or not? And most of them definitely don't try to correlate the RNA data with the histone data. So it was an incremental association of not only being able to perfect a uh, method of chromatin immunoprecipitation that isn't commonly done in vivo, but then taking all this raw data and finding out how to get from millions upon millions upon millions of reads from all kinds of biological samples. We're talking about 52 different rats here and analyzing them to annotate them. So it's a lot of bioinformatics. There's different steps associated with it. There's very few golden standards. So you have to try like all these different types of algorithms and programs that have been previously published and determine which ones seem to be the best. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, someone raised their hand. Yes. <laughs> because it's also an N3 PUFA. Most of these studies have specifically talked about, not the ones that I'm doing, but previous research, which also isn't very common in the colon, but in other organ systems do try to differentiate between marine N3 PUFAs versus the N3 PUFAs found in uh, vegetables. I guess you could count grains as vegetables. And you do see very specificity towards marine associated N3 PUFAs. So no, I don't think it would work. So why do you think there was such a disconnect between the level of expression and those modifications that you looked at? Do you think if you looked at other modifications that have better correlations? Or do you think maybe microRNA is that missing link between regulation of the transcript versus epigenetic I think that you are right on both. And because there are so many ways that's, that uh, these gene expressions can be regulated, and not only at the epigenetic level, but you have post-translational modifications, you know, once they leave the cell, you have protein folding, there's all these other factors. So I think they all play some sort of role in this. And it's also very possible that if I looked at something more general, so say I looked at overall acetylation, instead of focusing on one specific type of acetylation in the histone tail, I would see at least a more expected pattern of histone acetylation. Is there anything about like the half-life of an epigenetic modification versus the life of Transcript, is that something? It seems that epigenetic modifications are slightly more stable than transcripts in many cases. So it is possible, but studies don't show 
such a huge disconnect could be explained by just, you know, RNA decay. So when you said that it's possible, you know, when you ask me which mechanisms, I think it's likely many of them are. Maybe you can elaborate on something you didn't talk about today, but your, your cancer versus non-cancer. When, when did you find the correlation? Well, in that case, I didn't find a very good correlation in general in the differentially expressed genes versus the differentially enriched regions. But in the ones that I did find a good correlation were all associated with interferon type um, activation. And that's another talk that I could pull up right now. But basically there was, in that case, I did see very much more dramatic patterns associated with cancer versus non-cancer than associated with just different types of diets. So it was a very IRF, antimicrobial type effects were commonly associated with uh, differentially enriched regions and the RNA, which I don't see here. And you were gonna ask a question. Yeah, more of an observation. Uh, being at Cornwell is like roughly 98% of the 6 and the Considered that that might have an effect as well since you're supplementing with an N6 versus an N3 and then you supplement with fish oil. If it's the production of N6, that might be you know, half the reason you're seeing some of these findings or the actual N3 themselves. But I just wonder if something you considered or look at here. Or look at the ratio between N6 and N3 between the two diets if there's a difference between the two. There have been previous studies looking at the ratio, uh, not in an epigenetic setting, but as you say, because they're different lengths, I think that does play a role in these changes in activation that we're seeing. Um, this dog was very interesting. Um, my question is more like, um, um, if you have to talk for like general population, uh, how can you translate this information for to dietetic recommendations? The, I think the easiest way would be to mention that previous um, article that shows that vegetarian dietary patterns and the risk of colorectal cancer is mostly, it's most dramatically changed when you have a pesco-vegetarian diet, which means you get more fiber and more phyto, phenols? No, 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 um, the other chemicals inside. Phytochemicals, Phytochemicals sorry. And um, the pesco-vegetarians also have more fish oil plus these vegetables together. So. How would I specifically say epigenetics is associated with a better diet other than providing a mechanism? Um, if you can think of a way to get people to eat them more based on that. <laughs> but at least this provides a way to how it's happening. You know, one thing is to see a pattern and another one is to explain it. So I think mostly just bridging the gap. You like the changes in the oil concentration or the type of oil really has more to do with the ability to signal and then your your pectin or your short chains the ability to modify the chromatin. Yes. So that's really kind of the star mechanism here is that you're also you're modifying you're enabling those genes to be expressed if they need to, but you're also enhancing that signal capacity. And that's kind of what you saw with your nuclear receptors? Yes, that is exactly. So uh, you made that point probably better than I just made it, which is that because these N3 PUFAs are better signalers and better activators of the nuclear receptors and the N6 PUFAs, this is where you're getting most of this enhancement from. And then the addition of butyrate is sort of just acting as more substrate or healthy substrate to enhance this reaction. And even though you didn't ask about it, and it's totally not part of the talk, really. This is what I think is happening since you asked about the mechanism. So it's a very complicated slide. But what I think is happening is that the entry proofers themselves are activating the nuclear receptors. And since, you, since we just highlighted, this is an entry proofer specific activation. And the target genes of these FXRs and PPARs are associated with the transcription of beta oxidation genes. So then you have an increase in beta oxidation of not only the N3 PUFAs that are there, but the short-chain fatty acids, which can also be beta oxidized. And then these, all these new acetyl-CoA's are being transformed into citrate. And I don't think they're entering the energy cycle because I don't see many signs of that, but you would have to look it up before saying it's not happening. 
And then it is likely that those are increasing or changing the histone acetylations. So because these are not directly related, I think that's one of the reasons I see different genes being affected instead of the same genes. All right, on that fantastic last slide, then we'll have a, a big hand for the chair. Chair, remind us when your defense is? In three days. Okay, she'll finish writing her dissertation any day now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, oh, I'll come around and ask her. Oh, okay, she wanted to her off. <laughs> Could you, or just a possible consideration, you could run tracers on. Uh, the visual or pectin, see if they are actually going to be for energy. Yeah, it's like C14 labeled mm -hmm. in the carbon. Yeah, I think that would be a good experiment to do now that I have these findings. I mean, we weren't really expecting to find this beta oxidation associated genes being so. So, yeah, I think that would be a good follow up experiment. All right, thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs>